In the last video, we talked about the social discount rate and learned how to find the net present value of costs and benefits that happen in the future. Today, we'll do some calculations with NPV equations and use some tricks to think about flows of money rather than just sums. First, let's look to see how important the actual rate can be in determining the NPV for distant costs and benefits. I'll pop the equations into Excel just to remind you how much easier it is to do multiple calculations in Excel than it is on your phones. Returning to the question of how much I would pay today to avoid a million dollars in damages a hundred years in the future that we talked about in the last video, we saw that it was just $455 if I were using an 8% discount rate. I told you that most experts today consider the social discount rate to be between 1 and 3%. At 3%, we can calculate the NPV as NPV equals a million dollars divided by 1.03 raised to the 100, which is $52,000. Well, boy, that's a whole lot more than $455. It means that if we use a discount rate of 3% rather than 8%, we value damages in the future over 100 times more. Moreover, at 1%, we get 1 million divided by 1.01 .01 raised to the 100, 370,000, which is almost 10 times higher than even uh, what we got at 3%. So hopefully you can see why I consider the social discount rate to be the most important number in environmental economics that most people have never heard of. Here's a figure showing how net present value changes according to how far in the future costs and benefits occur, and uh, you can see the different discount rates. You can see that something that happens 60 years in the future has almost no present value at an 8% discount rate, but at 1% we value those costs and benefits at about half their future value. If the government uses the discount rate to evaluate policy, and it does, a high discount rate puts very low value on future costs, while a low one considers them highly. This is particularly important because there isn't a solid economic consensus about what number to use, so you can make a solid technical argument for at least using any value within the well-accepted range of 1-3%. to in fact, as we'll talk about in class, the Trump administration argued that using 3 to 7 percent was just going back to good policy from the 90s, and they used that number in dismantling EPA climate policies because at such a low level of concern about the future, investing now to avoid future climate change really doesn't appear to have much economic impact at all. Okay, but it's extremely rare that we have a lump sum payment on a particular date like in the example above. Much more common is a constant stream of money every year going forward that we want to convert into NPV, which is like a pile of money today. Let's consider building a seawall that then produces a benefit each year from now on. Maybe the seawall provides a million dollars in benefits every year starting next year when it will be completed. How much would I pay for that level of protection? Well, I just want the NPV of a million dollars next year plus a million dollars the year after plus the year after that and so on forever. In other words, at a discount rate of, say, 2%, uh, NPV is equal to 1 million divided by 1.02 .02 raised to the 1 power plus 1 million divided by 1.02 .02 squared plus blah 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 1 uh, million over 1.02 .02 raised to the infinity. I can simplify that by writing as it as a sum, NPV is equal to the sum from t equals 1 to infinity of 1 million over 1.02 .02 raised to the t. Now, I could figure out the value of each term until the change becomes really small, but it turns out, and some of you may even have proven this in the infinite sum section of your college algebra or calc classes, though I won't blame you if you don't remember, it turns out that the sum of, uh, of 1 over 1 plus d to the t is 1 over d. That's a pretty cool result. If you don't believe it, Let's do an approximation in Excel. Just remember that the smaller the d, the more cells you'll need to calculate in order to get close to the infinite sum because the values farther in the future still matter. Anyway, we can use this to write the general equation, NPV equals the sum from t equals 1 to infinity of z over uh, 1 plus d raised to the t. It's just the same as z over d. 
where z is the value of the annual cost or benefit. So if z is a million and d is 0.02, then NPV is 50 million. So if the seawall costs less than 50 million, we'll do it. If it costs more, we won't. Of course, I can only use my nice little function if I'm looking at a constant flow that starts next year. But what if it's going to take a while to build the seawall, so I won't start getting the benefit until year 4? Well, the trick here is to realize that when I say NPV is equal to something, I mean that it works just exactly the same as a pile of cash. So in the above example, in year 4, I'd be able to use the NPV equation to figure out the value, which would be 50 million then. But that's a pile of cash in year 3, the year before the stream starts, not today. But no worries, I know how to figure out the value of a pile ca of cash in year 3. I just discount it to today using our usual discounting equation. In this case, the net value in year 3 is the 50 million, so the NPV today is just 50 million divided by 1.02 raised to the third, which is 47.12 million. So the value of the project is less than 50 million because it misses the next three years of protection, but it's still worth a good chunk. What if I could throw up a temporary seawall to protect me starting next year and going just until the permanent wall was built? How much would that be worth? Well, if it offered the same protection as the permanent wall, but just for a shorter period of time, then it would be likely like we had a permanent wall the whole time as far as protection goes. The permanent wall for that amount of time was worth $50 million, and the permanent wall starting in three years was worth $47.12 million. So the temporary wall must be adding the difference between them. It's worth $50 million minus $47.12 million, which is $2.88 million. This should let you see how you can determine the value of something that starts next year and continues for a fixed amount of time, ending then, say, in five years. That's worth the same as the constant stream starting yet next year minus the amount of the constant stream starting the year after the benefits run out, which will be year six. So I just figure the constant stream and then subtract from that the value of the constant stream discounted from five years in the future. Now that you know how to figure out the NPV of a pile of cash, a constant stream, a constant stream that doesn't begin until some point later in the future, and a constant stream that ends at a point somewhere in the future, you should be able to figure out the NPV of any basic mix of future costs and benefits. A few things to keep in mind. The first is that I've been using costs and benefits interchangeably. The reason is that I'm assuming in environmental analysis you'd be paying now for some kind of benefit in the future. Maybe it's a direct benefit, like if you're interested in expanding wilderness or wetlands or something, but maybe it's a benefit of avoiding a bad outcome, like flooding or extinctions or something. But I treat them the same way in my analysis, at least at the level of discounting. Next. Realize that if we're taking cost-benefit analysis seriously and, for example, putting a value on human lives, then discounting doesn't just mean we prefer money today to money tomorrow, but that we would, for example, prefer people today to people tomorrow. In that case, we might determine that it would make sense to let 10 people die premature deaths in 100 years if it allowed us to save one person today. That seems like it violates the veil of ignorance idea, as we're clearly privileging one generation over another, though it gets complicated because economic growth suggests they'll value their lives more than we value ours. So the numbers are messier than I'm presenting here. But that's one drawback of converting everything into a common metric like money. At every step along the way, it seemed to make sense to convert things into their dollar equivalent in order to make comparisons. And if we have dollars, we can do certain things with them, like discount, but suddenly we wind up with what seems like a contradiction contradictory result. That should make you at least a little suspicious of the logic we followed to get here, but what you do with that suspicion is up to you. Also, it's possible that if we keep degrading the environment, then environmental amenities in the future will be worth a lot more than they are today. That would actually suggest a negative discount rate for some things like the value of a park or biodiversity alongside positive discount rates for economic goods, which again means you need to be very careful when thinking through intergenerational comparisons with an array of different kinds of goods. Finally, there's a lot of evidence that humans don't even discount in the standard exponential way that this model suggests. Instead, we may do something called hyperbolic discounting, where we have high discount rates for things happening in the short term, but much lower discount rates for things happening in the distant future. 
We still value the distant future less than the near future, but not as by as much as you'd expect based on exponential discounting. The UK has taken this into account. They actually use a different discount rate for short-term and long-term um, analyses in their uh, governmental cost-benefit analyses. But we don't do that in the US, in part because it leads to time inconsistencies and policy choices. But anyway, we'll leave this discussion there so you have some reason left to go to graduate school.